Hello, welcome to Any Answers Answered for November 2018. Tim and I, as ever, have been looking through the pages of uh, Accounting Web's Any Answer section and I found a couple of questions to have a closer look at. Uh, the first question this month is from CW2012 and is as follows. We have a client who has ceased to trade but is overdrawn as a director by around about £15,000. The only other balance sheet entries are a small bank balance and a minor bit of cash. Can I wind the company up and treat the overdrawn loan account as a sub £25,000 distribution and claim the capital gains treatment? I guess the question is, is it capital gains or if they've already had the money, do we have to acknowledge that 15 really is a dividend? Well, very interesting question. And of course, the 25000 is the threshold beneath which the distribution in the course of a winding up will not be challenged by the revenue as potentially an income distribution. And if you had a company with, say, £20,000 of cash at bank and £20,000 of shareholders' funds, and that is then wound up, the shareholder would receive, assuming it's a sole shareholder as it is here, the whole of that £20,000 as a capital distribution, and to the extent that there's a capital gain arising on that, it would qualify other things being equal for entrepreneur's relief. But if instead the balance sheet comprises, say, 5,000 of cash at bank and 15,000 of overdrawn director's account, although it used to be that insolvency practitioners would happily distribute the net value of the company in part by a distribution in specie in respect of the overdrawn account, so that would be a distribution in specie of 15,000, and that would be treated or would have been treated as capital, um, HMRC are more likely these days to challenge that, as the questioner is concerned about, mm. and treat it as an income distribution. Looking at the answers, um, one of them says, um, unless there's something you haven't told us and your figures are accurate, it's beyond doubt that the net assets and reserves are under 25,000. Why are you, any in, are you in any doubt? Um, and then another says that if the loan account was overdrawn without any intention of repaying it, um, that could indicate an intention, um, if that occurred before the intention to strike off the company, um, it could indicate that it was a distribution. But the most interesting um, comment, I think, is from Peter Windat, who refers to an article written in Taxation magazine in May of this year. And that article alerts us to this possible change in revenue practice and apparently a test case going through and the revenue wanting to argue that if you don't repay into the company, the overdrawn account, then the distribution of it in specie would indeed be treated as an income distribution and so potentially taxed at 38.1% mm. as a top rate distribution um, rather than as a capital gain. So I think the questioner is right to raise it and the answer is uh, to be on the safe side, get the director to repay the outstanding overdrawn account before the members' voluntary liquidation then winds up the company and the distributions can then be made as capital. And make sure that the various directors' minutes and what have you support that of that course. was exactly what had been done. Um, our second question this month reminds me of, uh, I always remember when I used to teach the opening year rules and it was always interesting that students would manage to get themselves so utterly and completely confused as to which periods of time were going to be subject to tax that before you knew where you were, they were taxing utterly, you know, three years earlier and things like that that couldn't possibly have been the answer. Anyway, the question comes from E. Lewis uh, and is as follows. We have a client with the year end of the 30th of April. The last accounts being prepared 30th of April 16 were submitted to the revenue on her 2017 tax return. She has never made much of a profit, in some years barely covered the purse allowance and for various reasons would now like to move to a 31st of March 18 year end. Now this of course would be a period of 23 months and what the questioner is saying is, from what she understands, the period can't be extended more than 18 months uh, to the 31st of October and then no further changes can be made for five years after that. Uh, if we were able to extend the year to 31st of March 18, there would still be a year end in the 2018 tax return change from April 17 to March 18. Can they do that or do they have to actually go back and change the previous year effectively to make all this work, help us out. 
Um, it is an interesting question and it's quite a complicated area. Nothing like as complicated as changes of accounting date under the old preceding year basis before 1997 were. Um, but that's uh, long since lost in the mists of time. Here, there are a couple of misconceptions. Um, 18 months is the maximum length of a valid company accounting period for tax purposes. There is no similar restriction in terms of accounting reference period for sole traders or partners. So there is nothing in law to stop a sole trader drawing a 23-month set of accounts. The question, though, is then what basis periods would follow. And if we have a change of accounting date, that new date is only going to be valid if it meets the conditions in the legislation. And to be valid, the period to the new date must be no more than 18 months. So that's where the 18 months comes from. Now, if this taxpayer were to change by simply having a 23-month accounting period, then in fact, initially, the change to that accounting date would be disregarded. And so, um, just checking what the years were, um, we would ignore the 23-month period to 31st of March 18 and simply take the 12 months to 30th of April um, 17, wouldn't it be? The old date. The old date. But then there would be a valid change to the 31st of March 19. So that would then delay the change of accounting date until we had that valid change. Very unusual in practice. Mm. Um, this, by the way, was something that cropped up in a case involving the actor Rupert Grint, whose accountant had advised him to change accounting date in a similar way, but with a 23-month period, which turned out to be invalid. Um, one of the commentators said... So, sorry, just to confirm, though, if they produced a 12- and an 11-month period, that's fine. Indeed. Um, one of the commenters said, you can prepare, do, in other words, do a single set of accounts for the 23-month period. It's just that the tax basis period are... 12 months and 11 months. Now that's wrong, and in fact that uh, commenter did subsequently uh, realise that they had misremembered the mm. Rupert Grint case. And for the basis period to be the full 23 months, less of course 11 months of overlap, you must prepare accounts first to the 30th of April 17, the normal 12 months, and then to the 31st of March 18, a further 11 months. Now, that will then give a valid accounting date to change of date to 31st of March 18. And the basis period for 17, 18 will then be 12 plus 11, the 23 months. But the mistake that Grint's accountant made was in not bothering to prepare the intermediate 12-month set of accounts. Why should I bother just do a 23-month set? Nobody mm -hmm. looks at them anyway. Well, actually, it is important where we're doing a change of accounting date. Absolutely. Uh, and, and as you say, the key point is you'd have to do it as two separate sets of accounts yeah. uh, over the two periods. They are the answers we're offering this month. And perhaps if you post on the Any Answers pages over the next month, then Tim and I will be looking at your question in a month or so's time. But for this episode, bye-bye.